Okay, Bergson and the Holographic Theory of Mind, Part 51, the Tofu Blocks of Consciousness Theory. So we'll look at the inventory of blocks briefly, special relativity, evolution theory, the holographic principle, AI, the concept of information currently reigning, and a few others. And a couple examples in Jude Kurvan, the Cosmic Hologram, and Deepak Chopra, Minus Kapitas, and You Are the Universe, to see the blocks in action. So there's a never growing number of theories on consciousness, the universe and consciousness, the big picture of the universe and consciousness. These love adore and nearly always employ a standard set of building blocks as standard blocks for building theory. As I've discussed through these series, I think these standard blocks are tofu after the Chinese complaint that lots of the construction in China appears to be made out of tofu. So the standard set of building blocks, start from the bottom. Quantum computing is coming and will change everything. The hard problem is explaining what it feels like. The holographic principle, Alice Susskind. AI and neuroscience is the right framework for the brain. Information is all and it's digital. QM slash the Copenhagen framework where the observer creates reality. Evolution by natural selection, or by some variant that saves it, that is, saves natural selection, that is self-organizing. Special relativity and general relativity. Now, I've talked about all of these in this, in, so far. We've hit these, these various blocks, and I'm just listing the, the uh, videos there. Special relativity, general rel relativity, evolution, et cetera, et cetera. Hard problem. Like I'm saying, Lord, how many discussions are the hard problem? AI, etc. This is the problem, as I've said. The solidity of each of these is questionable, each of these tofu blocks. The modus operandi, however, is to take them as unquestioned and begin building. And I think we've made the point. You just can't take these as unquestioned anymore and begin building. But we're going to look at an example of this. So Jude Curavan. The, Jude describes herself as a cosmologist and futurist. She has a master's in physics from Oxford, specializing in quantum mechanics and cosmology thereof. PhD in archeology, span specializing in ancient cosmologies. I wrote this book in 2017, The Cosmic Hologram. She's in lots of YouTubes. She spoke at the uh, Science and Non-Duality Conference, January of 2018. Note the book has a foreword by Urban Laszlo, and Laszlo has many books, and he's another builder busily using the tofu blocks. So there's a summary of the book on Jude's site. It shows what she sees as its main points. I'll use a lot of statements from the summary for the purpose here, but we'll be using the book quotes too. The site description begins as such. Until now, the scientific paradigm of reductionist materialism has maintained that mind somehow arises from matter, that reality is solely physical, and that its appearance of separation is real. Okay, this sounds okay. And instead, growing evidence is now revealing that the reality of our universe emerges from more fundamental realms of unified reality and that separation is an illusion. So this seems kind of Bergson-like, but now we get the giant tofu block. Reverting to the primacy of mind and consciousness, as exposed by Max Planck, David Bohm, and many other pioneering scientists, it is showing that universal mind articulized, articulated as digitized information and represented as dynamic and relational patterns and processes of reality, processes of vitally semiotic information literally and meaningfully informs the formation of our universe. So universal mind articulated as digitized information, but a bit is an abstraction. I always realized physically as some arbitrary state of an EM circuit. For example, here's one bit, a breadboard all the switches and transistors needed, or even in the old Stone Age case. The magnetic cores, note all the wires and switches. 
or a qubit, a state of a highly quantized LC circuit, also an electromagnetic phenomenon. So the qubit is an abstraction over the circuit. So this unphysically realized abstraction exists where? How? You're blindly visiting or revisiting the realm of platonic ideas. Further on, she notes an experiment that deleted a bit and got a theoretically ex expected amount of heat released. To quote, this and many other examples of increasingly compelling evidence are showing that such digitized information, the basis for all our technologies, is exactly the same as universal information, also articulated as digitized bits, that underpins and literally makes up all physical reality. So an amazing reliance on bits. The bits are correlated with the holographic principle on the, on the Tofu block, supported by a theoretic, theoretical framework and evidence at all scales of existence and across numerous fields of research with digitized information pixelated at the Frank Planck scale area of the two-dimensional holographic boundary slash brain of space-time, uh, the reality of our universe is manifested holographically. The first direct cosmological evidence for this was demonstrated in 2017. So by pixelated, Jude is referring to the granularity of the hologram plate. One can take chunks of the hologram plate and still project the whole object. That is, the information for the whole story resides, resides in each chunk. So I can take a little chunk of that plate. I still have all the information for the whole, and I can still project the pyramid ball via the reconstructive wave. It's a little less bright, a little less clear. The smallest chunk is the grain size of the plate. That's the limit. So we can take that little chunk and reduce it to the actual granularity of, of the plate, the smallest grain. That's the limit. So she's comparing the grain in the plate to the Planck length, which is absurdly small, 10 to the minus 33rd centimeters, and the Planck area then, the supposedly smallest unit of the universe. So pixelated or pixels, pixelated information, digital, one zeros, on the surface of a 2D universe. as such. And so we're going to have on that surface bits and pixels from which we'll project the whole world. On each grain of a hologram plate, however, is an interference pattern from the whole object, the constructive and destructive fringes. So when we're really, when she's making this analogy, again, note how the hologram is made. We have the reference wave, of a certain frequency from the laser. It's also bouncing off the object, a pyramid and ball. And then you've got this complex object wave. And at the plate then is the interference pattern of these two waves, reference wave and object wave. And so you have constructive interference where crest meets crest and trough meets trough. And destructive interference where crest meets trough or Picturing it this way, constructive and destructive, where the crest are meeting crest, we're getting a more uh, big wave, an ampl amplitude increase of the wave, and where uh, crest meets trough, we're canceling each other out. We're getting a straight line uh, there above that uh, destructive interference. So this translates on the plate to uh, brighter areas and darker areas on the plate. Or again, here's another picture of it where the two waves are meeting and the darker areas are the plus plus where, or the, actually the, the brighter areas are plus plus or where crest is meeting crest or trough meeting trough and plus minus is where the trough is meeting crest. So on a plate, you're going to have a very complex pattern composed of these interference fringes. Again, trust has originally shown. So 
again, when you're taking this down to a little pixel or grain, what you've actually got still on that grain is this complex interference pattern of crest and crest and trough and trough and where crest meets trough. In other words, a grain and the information they're on is not a bit. This is not a one zero. So we keep hitting this frustrating ambiguity, this eliding, this confusion in the information language. How you make this a bit, not quite clear. And the tiny Planck area or, or the in a universe that it, you're not going to have a truly flat 2D thing, that's sort of a mythology. You're going to have a little cube there, a Planck cube. It's, it would be dynamically changing, never fixed or static. How are you going to maintain that artificiality, that abstract bit in a dynamically changing, ever-changing universe? Interesting question. There's also a bit more to holography. She notes, whereas a hologram captures information about an object onto a 2D film or plate, artificially 2D, then projects it to create the holographic appearance of a 3D object, cosmologists are realizing that our entire universe takes information held in this 2D boundary and holographically projects it to create the 3D appearance of reality. So holographically projects, right. In holographic reconstruction, a light source, a laser, is beamed through the wave interference pattern recorded on that 2D plate. So what is this reconstructing light source for our universe? Susskind, as we saw, admitted that he had no idea. Again, the picture up there, they like they like the that film with the with the mythical flashlight passing through it, specifying the wavefront from from the clown. But he admitted he had no idea. There is no magic flashlight. It's a mathematical process. In other words, there is no ontology here whatsoever. Mathematics is not ontology. That is not a real physical thing. They have no real physical thing. This is the this is the rather absurdity of these um, mathematical uh, artifices that we're constantly dealing with here. So suppose indeed it's bits. You are projecting the physical, dynamically changing coffee being stirred with all of its forces and dynamics, the concrete forces and dynamics of that coffee stirring. How? From bits. Just a simple example in our normal computing world, a 101 bit pattern is a five. That is, we say it's a five. How do you print a five? Well, the bits are sent down wires to a port via a CPU that interfaces with a printer. The CPU is regulated by a clock to keep everything in sync. The printer knows how a 101 implies a five shape at a certain location on the paper and how the ink must be released from a cartridge to flow to form a five. This is part of the story. The semantics, in other words, of creating a five is not in the bits. And by the way, all of this, this difficulty is a featured problem of the quote, we live in a simulation notion that you see people discussing like Kaku, et cetera. Not to worry. To quote, the universal alphabet of ones and zeros is combined at all scales of existence to meaningfully inform the existence and evolution of our universe. Information is physically real and can be expressed as energy and matter. So ones and zeros. Yet elsewhere, Jude will say, electromagnetic flows convey information and shape, size, and stickiness. 
in relation to proteins is information. But how is this digital? How ones and zeros? Also, I would I note that too that with this this concept conception of information, the invariance laws, the invariance structure that structures events, as I've noted many times, velocity flow fields, adiabatic ratios, inertial tensors, etc., texture gradients, ratios, flows. This is Gibson's definition of information. That is invariance laws, the fundamental information for perception. This is utterly ignored. Is that say what? So we return to this. There's an underlying, well, very explicit conception of the role of mathematical relations in creating the universe of forms going on here. So another tofu block, of course, relativity. To quote, as for the third thermodynamic subset, the two laws of info infodynamics, which I'm not going through here, are both required to describe the fundamental nature of our universe and show how quantum and relativity theories are complementary and can be reconciled with each other. So, as I've noted, reconciling to which relativity? The common interpretation that every physicist that's explaining relativity to us is now using, it is the totally logically inconsistent version where time changes are ontological and space changes are purely measurement effects. The consistent version for which reconciliation is meaningless. The special version also stated in the 1905 paper, which, which was tailored just for Maxwell and is none of the two above. Or are you throwing relativity out? As Bell argued in supporting Bohm. And reconciling to QM what then? That is, what, what version of QM? To Bohm? To Copenhagen? In the book, Jude rejects many worlds, but otherwise seems to go with Copenhagen. Seems to, because we don't really know in the book. So we don't really know what this tofu block is made of, but probably Copenhagen. But if you view 45A and 45B, it's clear. You'd never build a theory of mind on the current state of QM and its Copenhagen framework. In other words, it's the measurement problem. And you've got to understand the measurement problem because your tofu block is made out of the measurement problem. So during the subject of evolution, to quote, when we restate the laws of physics as algorithms, instructions, that enable our universe to exist and evolve, voila, we have emergent universe, emergent from deeper informational, intentional, dynamic possibilities, meaningful, purposeful. So the emergence. There's actually another tofu block here, the reification of mathematics. We would want to contemplate Bergson here on the unreality of mathematical laws, as we saw in 49. But so what's going on here. She knows that the same law that applies to the frequency and power of earthquakes applies to the frequency and power of human conflicts. So we have a little coordinate system with power, increasing power, increasing frequency. And she notes we have big earthquakes, big power, but with low frequency, whereas we have little quakes, that is little disturbances with high frequency, and there's a law running from high frequency, low power to big quakes, low frequency. In other words, as frequency increases, power diminishes, and this is a form of power law. And she notes, again, as, as I noted, same thing for human conflicts, big wars, low frequency, little conflicts, high frequency. But the implication here is this same mathematical law is the driver, is the cause behind these phenomena, as we'll note, informing these things into form. So she says, so both of these, and all across from the uh, informationally manifest holographic universe, comes from deeper non-physical realms of possibility and potentiality, and something called attractors. 
Jude discusses the, the Lorenz attractor, this butterfly, which supposedly embeds Earth weather systems. She says, whether weather systems are earthquakes, they arise from deeper attractors of informational awareness. Now, we don't know what that term informational awareness actually means, but we must presume that it's some form of awareness in the realm of platonic ideas. So what is happening here? The book takes us through many discussions of attractors, fractals, self-similarity, complexity, power laws, emergence. The underlying thought is this, these mathematical forms or relations are not mere descriptors of universal becoming. Rather, these math forms are informational, perjured, informational. They drive things into existence, into structured, dynamic, organic, living, green, ongoing existence. Wasp, caterpillars, beetles, etc. These bits are driving into existence. These are living, organic forms. This includes, remember, this thing they don't want to look at. The, the instinctual knowledge that the wasp has to paralyze the caterpillar, just the nine precise points needed to sting it, to, to paralyze it, yet keep it alive, plus the head twist for the wasp young, else the wasp species doesn't get off the ground because this is how they breed. So somehow, via some mechanism, you have to account for this as well. That is, evolutionary steps, natural selection, aren't going to be able to account for the nine, the emergence of the nine point knowledge. You've got this to account for as well. So she says, the underlying fractal attractors bifurcate into emergent new forms. Here is where the origin of species truly lies. But this is not, self-organization and bifurcation of attractors is not gonna explain this. It's not gonna explain the wasp. You've got the great explanatory gap. The leap from these math forms as descriptors of the real to these forms is causally driving the creation, the concrete reality of the real. So yes, we're back to Burks's multiple critique and creative evolution. There is no passage from the frozen world, of static world of platonic forms to the concrete becoming universe. From the book, we find seeming complete acceptance of the Copenhagen QM interpretation with all its massive problems. To quote, there's literally no environment apart from the consciousness of the observer. This stance makes the hard problem unsolvable, but here is her solution. The challenge of answering Chalmers' famously hard problem, how something immaterial can arise from something material, that is the brain, is that it comes from an incorrect premise. Its fallacy is the assumed duality between the apparent immateriality of mind and the seeming materialism of the physical world. Now, we know the statement of the hard problem here, the format, how something immaterial can, ar ar can arise from something material, that is from the brain. The cup that is arising from the brain, immaterial perception somehow. But that's not this actual statement of the hard problem. As Chalmers really put it, how does your architecture, neural computer account for qualia? Or as I've said, should be stated more generally, how does how do you account then for the image of the external world? What is your problem? What is your model of that? So the statement something immaterial arising from something material is a possible gloss on it, but not necessarily the statement of the problem, and tends to take you down the garden path right off the bat. You're not seeing the actual problem. And I would say um, the rest is kind of fine. Then the apparent materiality of mind 
seem materialism in the physical world. Yes, it's even Bergsonian, kind of. Kind of, because she's still working in the giant tofu block, the classic metaphysic, with no awareness thereof. There was no discussion of the nature of time, the problem of time, the um, the nature of the classic metaphysic, etc. In, in, in Jude, no awareness whatsoever. And the question is, what does non-separation? Because we'll see that non-separation is part of Bergson's model, the subject and object relation. But in and of itself, what does it buy you for a solution of the hard problem? In and of itself, nothing. And to quote, such apparent separation is illusory. Instead of the, the instead the entirety of the physical world is being discovered to be literally the all pervasive expression of informational processes. And then she says that includes us, our personal thoughts, emotions, choices, actions, and behavior patterns are distinctive. It's become increasingly clear our group and collective conducts embody exactly the same holographic signatures as are exhibited throughout the so-called natural world. So question, how does this, and, th and we're looking at the solution there, how does this explain the origin of our image of the external world? For comparison, briefly, we see it lots of times, what a solution looks like. Yes, we have a holographic field, Jude would agree. But the brain is conceived as a modulated reconstructive wave passing through this holographic field. It's supporting a reconstructive wave. It's specific to a source within the field, the coffee cup, the stirring of the coffee cup. It's being specified, this world at a scale of time, symbolized by the buzzing fly of normal time scale perception, a couple hundred wing beats fused in a, in a blur. So the image is not within the brain. It's not arising in that strange perceptual or mental space that one can just define. Rather, it's right where it says it is, external within the field. But again, there's no separation truly in this field between the body of our guy there and the fly or the cup. The separation in reality is in terms of time, increasingly greater scales of time exposed by the brain, not due to spatial separation. And needed in all this is an indivisibly transforming field, not the time of the classic metaphysic of separate discrete instants. So when we ask how does this explanation of Jude explain the image of the external world, we have to say, right, it doesn't. And this is why this question put this way, cuts through the fog that swirls over all solutions to the hard problem. So we'll leave off on Jude here. We'll come back to her for a little bit later and we'll move on to uh, Deepak and Minas. So Deepak needs no introduction or explanation. Minas, his partner in this book, is a physicist. This is a big picture book. Praise paragraphs on the front page exists from such folks as Bernardo Castro, whom we've looked at, Ruth Kapsner, who we've looked at, Erwin Lanzano, Fred Allen Wolf, Stuart Hammerhoff, who we've looked at. For the authors, the book is not intended as just another exposition in physics. The book is fully intended to solve the hard problem. Hence, there's a section with 40 qualia propositions. To their credit, they're really trying to explore and come to grips with the nature of qualia. The problem, the tofu blocks are foundational and they open the book with the hard problem. Their characterization, what makes seeing totally mysterious can be summed up in a few undeniable facts. The brain has zero light inside it, being a dark mass of oatmeal textured cells. So our guys' brain there is dark, Nothing in there, nothing, no light there. Because there's no light in the brain, there are no pictures or images either. So the coffee cup, gone. When you imagine the face of a loved one or a coffee cup, nowhere in the brain does that face exist or the cup exists like a photograph. At present, 
No one can explain how invisible photons being converted to chemical reactions and faint electrical impulses in the brain creates the three-dimensional reality we all take for granted. Okay, it's almost like they see the problem as the origin of the image of the external world. One thing is known, however, creation of sight is done by you. Without you, the entire world and the vast universe extending in all directions can exist. So how do you do that? Somehow you're creating that coffee cup, else it doesn't exist. Well, hmm, this sounds like we're going to fall into the QM Copenhagen woo, that you have to have the observer to create all reality. But not really, but pretty much we're going to see. They quote Eccles. Great, a neuro, I think neuroscientist. I want you to realize that there exists no color in the natural world and no sound, nothing of this kind, no textures, no patterns, no beauty, no scent. So we get a nice world that we're looking at is obviously a gray, featureless, homogeneous block. Well, we have to have some color. That's kind of a problem, but it's, it's colorless. Well, the brain too has to be the same thing, colorless. And they know what Eccles means is that all qualities of nature from the luxurious scent of a rose to the sting of a wasp and the taste of honey is produced by human beings. All qualities of nature. So the entirety of the universe is one vast, homogeneous, colorless, qualityless block. Continuing. That's why the secret relationship is the most important one you have. You are the creator of reality. The process is effortless. When you see, light gains its brightness. When you listen, air vibrations turn into audible sound. The activity of the world around you and all its richness depends upon how you relate to it. So it's relational. There is indeed an objective world out there, they seem to be saying, that is the breaking from the QM the observer created reality, it would appear. There is no reality without an observer. There is an objective, objective world there. It's just that the world has no qualities. Not until the brain interacts with it. The interaction, of course, that's the mystery. So the world with no qualities, it's the homogeneous space, the classic metaphysic, the abstract space, that is a 4D space of points slash instants. Three-dimensional space of points, positions, one dimension of instance, that is, time becomes a series of instantaneous three-dimensional blocks. Each block utterly homogeneous with no qualities. Yes, the classic metaphysic, the mass of tofu block. We'll come back to the hard problem solution. Let's go to evolution. In evolution, the authors reject the path which features random mutations. They replace it with self-organization. To quote, in a self-organizing system, each new layer of creation must regulate the prior layer. So the generation of every new layer in the universe, from particle to star to galaxy to black hole, cannot be considered random. Stop there for one second. So they're saying the particles, well, we're building stars from the particles, in turn the stars are regulating the particles somehow, apparently through some principles of self-organization. Galaxies in turn built from the stars, which in turn are regulating the stars somehow. Now, this is their argument for saying that evolution cannot just be random events. It cannot be considered random given that it, in this case, the galaxy, was created from a pre-existing layer, the stars, that in turn was regulating the layer that produced it, the atoms. I know we're going to get an infinite regress here because the particles, atoms, have to re regulate some other layer. We're not sure what that is, but if we define that, we're going to have yet another layer, etc. Just a minor problem. But taking this conceptual approach in the biological context, each layer emerges from the same DNA, but they stack up, as it were, until the pinnacle the human brain, our guy there. Well, he might not be the pinnacle, but this is the building blocks model of the origin of life. We 
Saab Bergson discussing creative evolution in number 49. That is, it's coming from the tendency in matter combined with the intellect that allows it to be treated as a set of solids, inert solids, described by mathematical laws. I'd throw up here my little billiard guy if I had room for him. The billiard ball model. And then attempting to apply this tendency going against the grain, shall we say, to the biological. In other words, it's again, the um, Kant unified version of science. All aspects, all aspects of the science, binding or, or describing or counting for reality with the same mathematical force. That is, the principles of physics being used for biology and in turn for psychology, as though there was no difference among those three sides of this of this structure of science. This is simply not the case, but it's blindly followed. Go on. DNA has evolved the skill at building hierarchies because the entire universe was its schoolroom. These are interesting statements. This recursive system of self-reorganization pervades physics and biology. Again, the same principle. The idea that biology is simply treatable by and amenable to the treatment of physics, that is, inert solids, described by laws somewhat successfully. This entirely misses this problem, which they want to ignore. The, the wasp, the instinct, not instinctual knowledge of species of another. The wasp being able to paralyze by finding, knowing the nine precise points to sting the caterpillar, yet keep it alive, plus the head twist, such that its young can live off the caterpillar, else the species doesn't get off the ground, or the three precise points to sting the cricket. Again, this type of knowledge, instinctual knowledge, is not going to be des described as solved by self-organization. It's a problem they won't look at, because once you look at it, self-organization starts to be extremely, uh, shall we say, uh, inadequate. Remember, Bergson was led to the notion that instinctive knowledge that one species has of another, or possesses of another on a particular point, has its root in the very unity of life, a whole sympathetic unto itself, a quite different vision. So when you look at what they said, they're loading everything upon DNA. DNA must know all about the caterpillar all about the caterpillar's being such that the, those nine points are manifest to the wasp and simultaneously uh, designing the wasp structure to utilize this knowledge, the ovipositors, the stinger, etc. As discussed in number 26, DNA must similarly encode the vastly complex knowledge for web building, which is context dependent on every location, locale, they hang those webs. And then remember the scale there, the 300 feet is what it would look like if scaled up to human uh, dimensions and 90 foot high trees, 300 foot web. This has to be there from the very first spider. Self-organization is simply not up to this job. It cannot address the transitions either from mousetrap one to two, as we discussed or from mousetrap five to six. Remember, the mousetraps are analogs for the evolution of beetle, from beetle one to beetle two, or beetle five to beetle, beetle six, more advanced forms of beetles. But the mousetraps, as in the tra one trap one, the trap two case, we have, trans we have very concrete transitions. From the first trap, we've now added a platform, and then we've repositioned how the spring works and had to, had to position the spring and, and uh, tamp it down on that platform. Trap five to trap six, we've repositioned the whole uh, uh, slam down bar, shall we say. Now it's held down with a hold down bar, positioned very precisely. Uh, and uh, in other words, we've got transformations, concrete transformations of physical things that have to be made. 
This is the common sense knowledge problem, precisely. And if self-organization can do this, it solves AI's problem of common sense knowledge. But apparently AI hasn't discovered self-organization. No, it's not possible. The evolution tofu block here is more than just mutations and selections or even self-organization. It's a general mindset. That is, we don't need consciousness. Self-organization seems to help us explain that. Deepak and Minas very much seem like they want consciousness, but they uncut, undercut themselves here in trying to uh, remove consciousness from the equation with their self-organization. So they say, the origin of life forms is the differentiation of pure consciousness into multiple forms of life, or qualia conglomerates. And this almost sounds Bergsonian. And then they say the evolution of species is through natural selection, but in a much more comprehensive sense than the Darwinian natural selection. So they're rejecting that. What members of a species actually select for is enhanced qualia experience. This is the driving force in evolution. Hmm. As I'm recording this, I just noticed, well, what's your uh, mechanism for selecting qualia experience? I mean, you've just actually slid back the Dar Darwinian selection. But, okay, but then evolution is purpose-driven through each species as it experiments with its environment and gets feedback. The feedback loop is set up that creatively meets every challenge from the environment. But feedback, loop, feedback loops address nothing, pictured in our little slide here. Not the mousetrap transitions or the beetle transitions or the uh, knowledge of the wasp or the caterpillar or how to build spider webs, nothing. Deepak and Minas are not engaging with the problems, the nature thereof. So they say genes, epigenes, and neural networks store and remember each step of evolution following the path traced by experience. These recording devices are symbolic signatures of dynamic qualia networks. Each network is self-organizing. Again, none of this is up to the task. They're not engaging the problems. My opinion, at bottom, an attempt to save mutations less natural selection via self-organization, that's what we're seeing, and a miraculous storage ability ascribed to DNA. It's still tofu. Sorry about that guy. So we come to time. In a chapter, where did time come from? We begin with the usual allegiance to the current logically inconsistent interpretation of special relativity. To quote, Einstein showed us that the rate of time passing would depend on the frame of reference one is in. Thus relativity dismantled forever the assumption that everyone's experience of time is the same. Time is not universally the same for every observer. So they're invoking the special relativity interpretation symbolized by the twin paradox where time changes are very real, very ontological. The differential aging of the two twins, the one being very young, the one aged is a very real, very ontological, very physical time effect. And when relativity toppled absolute time, it also toppled space. As with time, space looks distorted when measured at different moving frames of reference. So they're giving the same interpretation that changes the space. It's ontological, it's very real. But we thought that the length changes or space changes were just measurement effects that the length of the change of the Michelson Morley apparatus arm is not ontological. It's an apparent, not an actual contraction of the arm in the direction of the ether flow. Remember again, Lorentz's solution, his contraction was rejected by physics because they couldn't understand how it could happen. But Einstein's special relativity was considered cool because it got rid of the real effects and made them measurement effects. 
And it's on that basis that Michelson-Morley or relativity explains the Michelson-Morley experiment and explains away the ether only on that basis of apparent or measurement effects. Problems with your rulers. There's being light rulers in this case. So we have time changes in relativity, current interpretation, ontological. Space changes, non-ontological. When I say current, interp current interpretation, I mean every expositor of physics you read says this. Time changes ontological, space changes non-ontological. But how do you hold this in a mathematical system that is a mathematical group which the Lorentz transformations comprise in the way that Einstein embedded it, where space unit decreases must compensate for time unit increases. That's how it works. Reciprocal co uh, compensation. And therefore, these changes must be of the same order. Time changes cannot be ontological, and space changes non-ontological. They both have to be, in fact, non-ontological, else relativity falls apart. But in fact, it has fallen apart. So when your theory of time is screwed up from the get-go, with this Toffler block, nothing gets off the ground. Now note, in number 49, time is a force. We noted Bergson noting that we must wait for that sugar to dissolve. This, it cannot be sped up, it cannot be slowed down. It cannot be treated like a mathematical equation that can be sped up and slowed down. Therefore, in that, concept, in that uh, paragraph we just read, where they're saying time is not universally the same for every observer, that is, if time is not a universal flow invariant to all observers, then time cannot be a force, as Bergson argued. Time cannot be the force that's propelling the universe into existence. So this is a profound feature of the argument between Einstein and Bergson and Minas and Deepak are simply not understanding in reality what they're even arguing for here. Continuing, materialists insist that no psychological component is needed but the history of quantum physics points the other way. Schrodinger has been dismissed as a mystic, but he knew based on empirical evidence that at a basic level of subatom a subatomic particle doesn't behave like a tiny planet, but like a smear of possibilities. The observer determines which possibility, the observer, and now here we come back right back to the QM thing, the observer, uh, Copenhagen thing, the observer determines which possibility will undergo a change of state manifesting as an object that can be measured. See why I, when I started out saying it's kind of QM, uh, QM Copenhagen, but not, but yet it is. See, they, it, they really are just confused. This is the Copenhagen framework. This is the basis for quantum woo, but it's exactly what Schrodinger detested. They're not catching that even. It's, it's, it's the why of his cat what he thought was an absurd quantum mechanic implication that he couldn't handle you know, of his correspondence with Einstein, who also couldn't deal with this. Remember, remember the uh, gunpowder experiment that Einstein was des describing to Schrodinger, where gunpowder is somehow simultaneously exploded and not exploded, which they both thought absurd. And the CAT experiment came after this discussion, the, the CAT thought experiment. So, their quote there is just absurd, but it's the quantum woo, it's the tofu block. But it's clear their hard problem solution then is entangled in the quantum woo. The observer is creating the world by measuring, even though the world is there. I mean, I, you know, this is just ridiculous. It's why understanding the actual nature of the measurement problem is so important. Continuing, so the best answer to the mystery turns out to be a human answer. We didn't have to be present at the Big Bang for it to have a psychological component. The only version of the Big Bang we will ever know is a story told by human beings using our mind and brain. 
The same mechanism is producing reality at this very moment. In this chapter, we've given you a preview of the benefits of a human universe where time is on your side because you participate in creating it. But in reality, all of this is related to the specification of a scale of time for participating in creating it via the range energy state. Remember, as noted many times, the brain via its dynamics, chemical velocities, and a ton of other biochemical stuff underlying this is specifying the scale of time. Normal scale buzzing fly could be a heron like fly, could be an ensemble of electrons. But this is just being unnecessarily conflated with their tofu block, the quantum woo, participating, creating it in that sense. But that isn't the sense that we're creating it. Now, both books, Jude's and Deepak Minas, extol the general theory, with both noting the LIGO experiment and its finding, its breakthrough discovery of gravity waves from, let us note, two black holes colliding a billion years ago. They can't detect it from the sun or Jupiter, but two black holes colliding a billion years ago, we can detect. That should give you an indication of the uh, suspiciousness. This is an absurdly flawed experiment. I'll just put a link to it. There's a link to it in my, on my site of a critique of this. I'll just say critical examinations of general relativity, its confirmations are very disturbing. Bergson, I noted in their special relativity stuff, destroyed general relativity's thought experiment foundation, Einstein's thought experiments at the very foundation. But it seems the tofu block builders never look at the problems with these theories. So back to the hard problem. The Copenhagen framework weaves through what now becomes a long path to their ultimate solution. The last quote was page 95. We're gonna to get to the solution at around page 230, or 135 pages later. We can't go through the details. Suffice it to say, we read through a series of Quote, we're almost there. Well, not quite yet. Wait for more thoughts, something like that. It's sort of like, I couldn't resist our little beetle there. Just like my symbol of the hard problem, pushing up the, uh, the tough rock and uh, well, falling right back again. Finally, the solution. So it must be true that the brain serves one function, to give access to the mental space to give access to the mental space where all concepts, experiences, memories, images, all qualia reside. So we end stuck with Josh Gabak. In that mythical space, Joska had everything in a perceptual space. The coffee cup, stirring of the cup was in a perceptual space. For Deepak and Minas is a mental space. Some mythical space, any space, but that abstract space, the homogeneous, quality-less point continuum of the classic metaphysic, their ultimate tofu block, and what they're really dealing with here. So postscript. Trying to build theories of physics, consciousness and mind, merely on these tofu blocks is doomed to fail. The blocks have to be examined, looked at critically. We've looked at these, relativity, the QM, the measurement problem, evolution, information versus invariance laws, quantum computing. For each, when the cracks are seen, the crack is opening towards vistas that mean huge areas of thought must change. You can't just build upon them. Second postscript. At the end of her book, Jude describes her mystical experience at age four. Pretty impressive for age four. To quote, in it, I seem to be at the center of a vast interconnected and pulsing, pulse, pulsing web of rainbow light. And she compares this in the book to Indra's net. As a, as a an, very much like an Indra's net vision, which shimmered in geometrical shapes 
that repeated it had mirrored each other from the smallest to the largest scales I had a sense of, and as far as I could see. Instead of being merely fixed, they changed from moment to moment, so dynamically changing that. And I became aware that there were living forms of light made up from their patterns. Cool. So we get a sense of what drives both her mathematical love, her love of mathematics, and this, her vision of the evolution of consciousness, which she states here. In the years following the cataclysm of World War I, which was where Bergson was embedded, World War I, the concept of noosphere that derives from the, derives from the Greek word nous, meaning mind, was developed by Pierre de Teilhard de Chardin, Edward Veloy, and Vladimir Vernatsky. In thinking about the future of humanity, these three visionaries saw ahead to a potential for the processes of increasing complexity to evolve from an environmental biosphere to such a collective and unifying human and essentially planetary consciousness, that is, the noosphere. So, in other words, we're saying the biosphere evolves to the noosphere, this realm of ideas, concepts, conception of consciousness and therefore a collective consciousness, a collective planetary consciousness. Now, I got the robot in there because truthfully, none of these guys could say why a robot shouldn't be there. So just to sort of uh, stick it in there. But it is interesting to note that two of these folks were profoundly connected to Bergson and the third indirectly, Edward Leroy, wrote a book, Bergson and Bergs, Bergs and Nisma. And he was, a, to quote Wiki, a friend of Teilhard de Chardin and Henry Bergson's closer disciple. He succeeded Bergson at the College of France in 1922. He was one of those close to Bergson who encouraged him to turn to the study of mysticism, explored in his later works. Well, the later work being the uh, Two Sources of Morality and Religion. And then Teilhard de Chardin, the phenomenon of a man. Again, a little description here. At age 16, Chardin knew that he wanted to become a Jesuit priest. His studies and teaching took him to Cairo and eventually to Hastings, England. It was in Hastings that Teilhard began to read a book titled Creative Evolution, written by the French philosopher, philosopher Henry Bergson. It was a book that the Vatican soon placed on its list of forbidden books. Yet it was a book that inspired Teilhard to learn more about the theory of evolution. Now, as we've seen in our discussion of creative evolution in 46, 47, and 49, it's going to be hard not to get this kind of vision of, of uh, a vast evolving creative universe evolving toward higher consciousness, because we saw that to agree in Bergson. But I'll go on for a second. And in his new work and study of this in this field, he discovered a scientific justification for the unity that he felt he shared as a human being with the entire world of living creatures. And then when you read about Vernansky, you'll see he was in fact influenced by Leroy, who was the confidant of Bergson. Bergson, of course, is nowhere to be found in, uh, in Jude's discussion. Uh, there are deep problems in this entire literature, in this subject, the evolution of consciousness. And there is much that has not been learned from him, but perhaps we'll get to that later. Just an interesting note. Next time, maybe a look at Neuralink versus Bergson. Might be interesting if I can divine enough about Neuralink. Or we'll see. Till then, signing off.